Hey, welcome back to another video. I hope you're having an awesome day. Today, we're taking a look at the fat channel or the channel processing on the PreSonus Studio Live Series 3 console. So let's jump in. Hey, if you're new here, my name's James and I help sound tech save the day by eliminating distractions and helping you get the best mix of your life. If that's you, go ahead and hit subscribe to get notified whenever I post new content. Now, if you're not familiar, the engineer's blessing goes like this. May your bottom end always be big and round. And while I do appreciate my bottom end being nice and round, it really means that things are going to be labeled fat. Does this console make my audio look fat? Presonus hopes that you answer that question. Yes, it does make my audio look fat. If you missed the console overview, I go over the main parameters that you have there, but today we're diving deeper into the fat channel section. So if we're selecting a channel and then hitting input, we're going to see an overview screen of everything that's going on with the channel processing here. We've got our EQ, gate, compressor, and limiter. We've got all our aux mixes and the different colors tell you whether that's an aux send, a matrix, or a subgroup. We've got our channel input parameters over here with phantom power, polarity flip, channel linking and pan, our preamp control, high pass filter, and our input delay. If you don't know what input delay does, just leave it alone. You'll thank me later. The high pass filter is part of the input section. So this getting rolled up, it controls an EQ parameter, although it's part of the input section. Uh, this is helpful for you know sending, uh, say something to the monitor mix you want them to not hear every single EQ control or EQ change that you make, but you still want them to have a signal that has a high pass filter on it. That's why it's over here. From here, we can either touch the screen to get to the different sections, or we can use these buttons across here to get to the different sections. And the signal flows mostly from left to right, although there are some uh, differences uh, in one of the things you can do. So here we've got our input. If we select our gate, we see all the gate parameters. Now, one thing to make sure that you're paying attention to is that this processor on button is lit up. Otherwise, that processor is bypassed. You're not getting any signal from there. So it's not gonna be doing anything to your signal. You can have all your settings perfectly set with your gate, your attack and release time, just perfect for your kick drum. But if it's not on, it's not doing anything. So. Look out for that one. Over here on the right side, we have our key source. You can also switch to expander mode, which applies a ratio to open up the gate rather than having it uh, pushed down by a range or we're pushing it down by a certain number of decibels. So in gate mode, this range, we can have it turn it down just a little bit or we can have it turn it down a whole lot when the gate is not open. Next, onto the compressor. We've got pretty standard compressor controls on the standard compressor, right? And again, remember to turn it on, you know, make sure this light is lit up so that we're actually using the compressor. It's helpful to have these knobs up here because you can fiddle with multiple parameters at one time. So you can kind of get, get it dialed in, pull this down, and maybe mess with your attack time. Again, it's also helpful with your compressor after you've turned down it with gain reduction, you bump it up with some input gain or output gain on the output part of the compressor. So that gain is after the compression circuit. Now, if you get in a pinch and you wanna reset your parameters really quick, here's a hack you can do. Hold down the tap button and twist the knob that you wanna reset and it will go back to its default parameter right then. So. That's a quick tip. It's gonna save you a lot of time, especially if you're trying to reset things. Now that we're to our compressor, we can choose whether or not our compressor or our EQ comes first. So our EQ usually comes after, but with this button here, we can switch and make it so that the EQ comes before the compressor. A lot of times in live sound, I like to have my EQ before my compressor because most of the time, I'm cutting out a lot of stuff that I don't want in that signal. I don't want the stuff that I'm cutting out to trigger the compressor in a weird way. So I wanna have my EQ first when I'm cutting. A lot of times if I'm boosting, I'll put my EQ after. So the stuff that I'm boosting isn't triggering the compressor as much. Little food for thought there. Now back to the compressor, there are different algorithms or 
different processors that you can use in place of the standard compressor. Bundled with the console comes the tube version, which is very simple. It's got peak reduction, which is like your threshold. You turn it up to turn it down. And it's got gain or output gain to boost up the signal after you've turned it down some with your compressor. This one is very slow and gentle, and I talk about it more in this video up here where I talk about my fat channel processors and the different plugins that are usually bundled with consoles. Again, when you switch the plugin that your compressor is using, it's going to default to being off. So either tap that to turn it on or turn it on up here. If you select the fat version, this has input and output. And so these are gonna behave a little bit different. It's basically got a fixed threshold and you turn up the input to get more compression, but you're gonna wanna dial back the output so that you don't get a bunch of gain and cause something to feed back. The attack and the release times here are very fast on this one. You'll notice that the tube version didn't have attack and release. Those are automatic and function pretty slowly. Uh, not so slow that you're gonna like wait for it, but it's gonna be very smooth transition and gentle. You can see your ratio controls are over here. And there's also the key source and key filter things over on that side as well. For our EQ, the standard EQ is pretty rad. The way that they've mapped it on these encoders is really helpful. Uh, one thing to note, you can get back and forth between the bandwidth or Q and the frequency with this button right here. So I can make this very narrow or wide with that, hit the button and I can change the frequency again. Again, I hate to reiterate this so many times, but you might forget you got to turn it on. Now, one bummer about this console is that the high pass filter is not easily adjusted from the EQ screen. So if I want to adjust my high pass filter, I have to go back to the input screen and turn it on and then go back to my EQ to adjust the low band there. A lot of times I'm using those in conjunction with one another. So I've got to change the way that I think, and I've got to hit an extra button in order to EQ something and really dial in the low end. And remember, it's all about the low end. When you get that right, everything else falls into place. So an extra button hit back and forth, it's kind of a bummer, but it's not a deal breaker. I mean, this console's still pretty rad. Over here, we've got our high and low shelf options. So we can use a low shelf uh, to either cut or boost. And these also have bandwidth control. So if you see funky stuff where you've got, you're boosting, but you've got this big dip right there, go over to the Q or bandwidth, bring that back. And that'll make it look a little bit smoother and not uh, be so drastic and a steep shape there on your low or high shelf. Now there's also an RTA built in. So let me hit play again. And you can see on the screen, a real time analyzer of that input. That can be either pre-EQ or post-EQ. By default, it's post-EQ. So you see reflected on here the level changes that you're making with your equalizer. Or you can set it to pre so that uh, you can see what your EQ is doing uh, or what the signal is like before your EQ is doing anything. So that's a really handy tool there as well. Now, the thing that I like the most about this EQ is not that it sounds any better than any other EQ, but you can turn on and off different bands independently. So let's say I'm trying to dial in, I'm trying to figure out where is this one frequency that I'm not liking, right? I could hunt around for it and get real narrow and start boosting and sweep around and try to find it, right? So maybe I hate this frequency right here. I could do that, and then I could try to cut it and see if I got rid of it. Or if there's also an overtone that I'm not cutting, that maybe I affect something, but there's something else that I'm not liking. I can turn on and off just that one band to see if I hit the mark with that one. Now, on a snare drum, let's imagine that I'm boosting some top end. Oops. And I'm boosting some high mids as well to try to get some crack out of it. If I had to turn off the entire EQ to see if I got what I wanted to do with that band, I would also be losing a big part of the other parts of the snare sound. So this is really helpful for me, both as a mixer, but also as a teacher, when I'm trying to teach people how to mix, how to make EQ changes, see if what they're doing is actually doing what they want it to do. Bypassing individual bands on that EQ is brilliant. So 
kudos to PreSonus for including that feature on there. Now there's not a dedicated button for this, but if we go back to the input page, we can select the limiter. Now a limiter is basically like a don't get any louder type controller. So as I set the threshold and turn this down, uh, I've got to do it from this screen here, the level will not go up above that point. Now there's no makeup gain on here, so you'd have to do any makeup gain with your fader, but this is gonna keep things uh, safe, so to speak. So I would only use this in a safety first kind of context where something might get suddenly louder. Uh, I usually don't use limiters on my input channels. Now I would have rather seen a de -er because I really like being able to turn down the S's and the T's compared to the high frequency level on vocals when they're singing vowel sounds. It gives a nice breathy sound. It gives a nice airy feeling without having the S's and T's come out and crush you. All right, nobody likes that. So I would have traded a limiter for a de -er right here. They didn't do that, but maybe they'll do that in a future update. Now, the last thing I'm gonna show you about this, and I think this is actually really, really brilliant, is the A, B function, right? Remember how a minute ago I was talking about you have to learn and figure out whether or not you like the changes that you're making. So the AB function lets you choose between two different channel settings. So I can have something set up on A, and then I can say, okay, I'm gonna try a totally different approach for maybe the way that I EQ the piano, and see if that fits in the mix better. And instead of having to change a bunch of different parameters back and forth, and by the time I get there, I've forgotten what it sounded like in the first place, I can set up two different EQs and go back and forth between them with the AB function. Let me show you how to do it. All right, so let's take a look at the piano in the context of the mix. So this EQ works. Maybe I want to flatten it and try something else. So I'm going to hit AB and I'm going to make these changes. And I'm going to go for a fuller piano sound. Maybe I take my uh, high pass filter down. And I'm going to take the high gain down. So now when I hit that again, now I can make a bunch of changes with one hit of the button and it just works. I don't have to think about all the different changes that I made back and forth. I can just decide whether or not I like one approach over the other. And this is super, super handy. Now, one other place where you could use this is imagine you've got a guitar player that's playing a strap for one song, and then they pick up a semi-hollow body for another song, and you wanna have a different EQ without having to have an entirely different channel. You can load one setting into the A, the other one into the B, and then you can switch when that song comes up. Now, let me take just a second to help you understand what a key source is. So in any dynamics processor, whether that's a gate or a compressor, we have the audio path or what's traveling through on the input and on the output. But then we also have the side chain path or what the compressor or gate is looking at to know when to operate, whether to open that gate or close it again, whether to push down with compression or let it go through. So usually we want our key input to be the source or none. So what the compressor is looking at is the channel that we're on. Now, I rarely, if ever, use side chaining on my inputs. So there's that, but I thought I'd explain it to you. Let's imagine that we want to gate our snare bottom because we're getting too much of the kick drum or the kick drum pedal is squeaking through that snare bottom mic. So we might have our snare bottom gate opened up by the snare top. So whenever the drummer whacks on the snare, the top mic opens up that bottom mic. So we would go to our snare bottom and turn on the gate. Then we would set our key source to be channel two, right? Channel two is our snare drum top. Now we can either put a filter on it so that we can select a certain frequency that we want to have highlighted that can open up that gate, or we can leave it off and the full range of the signal is gonna be on there. Now, when our snare drum top hits, it opens up the bottom snare drum mic. That's one way that you could use side chaining on a gate or an expander. 
So we can listen to the snare top, we can listen to the snare bottom. The snare bottom now doesn't have the kick drum in it. So in case you are curious, and in case you get in a pinch, that's how you use it. Now, if we want to turn our key source back to none, then this would operate just as it would normally. Music in this episode is from the Golgotha Project and Poor Bishop Hooper. You can find out more about them through the link in the description below. I've got more tutorials on how to EQ and compress stuff up here. If you liked this video, give it a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, drop them down in the comments below. I love reading those. If you haven't yet, Go ahead and hit subscribe, and we'll see you back here next time on Attaway Audio.